You're watching Talking Points, a focus on the political scene in Lubbock and across the South Plains. And welcome back. Here's a look at some of the political headlines of the past week. The next public hearing for the Charter Review Committee is coming Thursday, 5.30 in the Council Chambers over at Citizens Tower. Lots of folks there last time talking about updating the Charter, whether the Council members should be paid a regular salary, among other things, so get there early. Lubbock County Sheriff Kelly Rowe has been reappointed to the State Commission on Jail Standards for a term that expires in 2027. They establish standards for care and treatment of county prisoners as well as maintenance and operation of those jails. Sheriff Rowe is also the past president of the Texas Jail Association. City Councilman Randy Christian spearheading a plan to honor local country legend Mac Davis. They want to have a life-size statue built in Mac's likeness. And Mac's wife Lisa and Lubbock's own Don Caldwell also involved in this. Expected to cost around $750,000. Councilman Christian says fundraising for that will start soon. And they'll search here and all over for the right artist and eventually place the statue right in front of the Overton Hotel. See if all goes well. They hope to have the statue there within a year. And Lieutenant Governor Dan Packard renewing his call from Texas legislature to pass new and tighter voting regulations and blasted companies like Texas-based American Airlines for boasting their opinion to, or excuse me opposition to this. Mr. Patrick calls uh, Senate Bill 7 and the election integrity bill. Democrats call it voter suppression. It limits voting hours, bans drop-off ballot boxes, and allows poll watchers to record voters. Nothing has changed for mail-in ballots, election day, or early voting. And anyone who says different is lying to you. Whether they write with a pen, talk with a microphone, or hold political office. Well, Mr. Patrick's telling companies to stay out of politics, voting rights advocates are asking businesses to complain even more. All right, and let's spend five good minutes with Mike Collier, who's one of the hardest working candidates in showbiz these days, back through the area, and a new campaign announcement this That's week, right. right? Well, I have a desire to run for lieutenant governor uh, on the Democratic ticket, mm -hmm. and so we're exploring that possibility, starting in West Texas. And so I was in Amarillo this morning and worked my way back uh, in the direction of DFW. Uh, you know, Dan Patrick is not the right man for the job. Texans want somebody who will just solve problems. I ran against him in 2018 on that basis. Uh, came very close. Mm -hmm. So we're going to finish the work that we're in. You know, a big thing in the news, of course, in recent days has been the backlash over these so-called voter integrity bills. Right. Uh, one moving through the Texas legislature right now, uh, the current lieutenant governor talking a lot about that this week, a lot of back and forth with some corporate folks already. Where do you stand on all of this? I don't believe it's about voter integrity. Uh, Brian, I think it's about accountability. And that's the problem. I think if people can't vote, then you can't hold folks like Dan Patrick accountable. And that's what this is all about. I think he feels political liability for the grid, for COVID, for all sorts of things. And if he can suppress the vote, he's more likely to win. I think it's corrupt, and I'm not for it. We, we visited since, I know, but the last time we spoke when you were through here as a candidate for lieutenant governor, right. I remember talking a lot about the fact that a lot of state newspapers had uh, endorsed your, your campaign. And that had a lot to do, it seemed, with how you wanted to pay for public schools. Has any of that plan changed now at all between then and now? No, not slightly. And I'm glad you asked that question because with so many things going on right now, who's working on schools and passionate about public education? It seems to take a back seat when such things as the grid goes down and we have COVID and the rest. I remain passionate about public education and I'm fighting for the teachers, the retired teachers, everyone, parents, folks who are concerned about public education. That is and will remain a very high priority for me. And that comes out of property tax reform here as far as paying for all of this, right? And our property, our tax system is not fair. Mm -hmm. And the people that are, that are getting hurt by this are homeowners. Our property taxes keep going up. And yes, our, yet our money doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go as far. And so we have problems in the state revenue system that we have to address. How do you do that, though? I mean, folks have tried this in one way or another and, and, and cutting here and adding there and doing all these little things for years. Where's the final solution? The place that? to start is there's a gaping loophole that everybody knows about, that the owners of large commercial and industrial properties are not paying their taxes. There was a law that was introduced called Equal and Uniform in 1997. It was for a while called the property tax death spiral. They are not paying their taxes, and everybody knows it. The only thing that's lacking is the political will to close that loophole, which is the right thing to do. And by the way, when Republicans hear this, their blood boils just like everybody else because it's not fair to homeowners and mm -hmm. small businesses. Who eventually have to go vote and elect them back to office, potentially anyway. Right. 
Folks in Lubbock are watching, of course, the re reaction to the deficiencies of ERCOT. You mentioned it a little bit earlier, and, and the Public Utilities Commission as well since the, the, the big freeze last winter. We're, we're switching to the ERCOT grid here in Lubbock in a few months. I know you have a, a CPA background, a bit of an energy background here too. What's your thoughts on, on the current state leadership's proposed reforms? Are they heading in the right direction here? Well, they're heading in the right direction. The question is, will they have any teeth? Will it work? Uh, you know, I'm very suspicious of the head fake. Uh, something that sounds like sound policy that doesn't get the job done. The acid test is this. Will the energy producers winterize or will they not? And over what period of time? That's the thing to watch. If all they're doing is authorizing the PUC to mandate winterization and authorizing the PUC to, to collect fines if they don't, that doesn't mean that the PUC is actually going to do it. So what I want to see is whether or not there's real teeth in this legislation mm -hmm. so that we solve this problem right away. If Lubbock's going to be part of ERCOT, then Lubbock is at risk like the rest of the state. What happened is awful. I'm not an expert on, on, on business matters, and I know you, you're a much bigger part of it than I am. How much, just from a politician standpoint, how, how much of a rabbit hole do you go down if you're mandating companies to change their equipment to do their job? Is that, is that a, the right thing to be doing as a, a government entity? Well, here's the problem we face. Let's say that I'm a generator, I'm a big generator, and I've decided that I'm not going to spend money to winterize. I'm just going to shut down my plant if it gets cold. That's the free market, right? Mm -hmm. But if all generators do that, then guess what? The whole state goes down. So at some point, you have to find the right balance and make sure that people do right. I don't like regulation. I mean, I'm a free market kind of guy. However, you must make sure that the system runs. You know, they're going to be businesses that don't come to Texas because that grid went down. They're folks that are in, in uh, high-tech manufacturing in the Austin area, by, as one example, in a very competitive world against the Chinese, they can't afford to have a week down. Mm -hmm. They'll think twice about coming to our state if they don't think our grid's reliable. I remember talking to you before about making changes uh, in Texas to, to address the cost of health care better technology, price transparency, things right. of that nature, that we're heading into a post-COVID uh, reality for health care. Is it time for more Medicaid expansion here in Texas? Well, support is clearly building for Medicaid expansion. There are Republicans now that are thinking that we should do this. I've all along said that we should expand Medicaid because it's a good financial deal. The business community has been firmly with me on this. Uh, I don't think that we will expand Medicaid because I think folks at the top of the organization, Dan Patrick, will block it. It's bad financial logic, it's bad for the state, it's bad for business. We should do like most other states and expand Medicaid. Just the federal dollars themselves to help with the process would seem at least on the surface to be a, a good thing by doing something like that, right? Well, it's very good for our economy. I yeah. mean, I think studies have shown that for every dollar that we pay, there's a copay, mm -hmm. but for every dollar that we pay in the form of copay is a dollar thirty or a dollar forty that comes back to us. It's a good financial deal. Of course, we're in a heavily conservative part of the state here. A lot of folks here will look at this and immediately say, well, Mike's a Democrat, he's the enemy. Um, what's your message for folks who, like a lot of people, make up their minds early based upon whether the person has a D or an R next to their name? Well, I think there's no avoiding that in politics today. I will say this, that I'm communicating with people who are more concerned about the policy frame, what's good for the state, what's bad for the state. That's the way I position it. So I have a point of view as to what's good for the state and the people in it. Um, my job is to communicate that, and then we'll see who votes for me. 3.8 million people voted for me last time. Uh, like they say, you know, a football team has never lost a game. They just ran out of time. Mm -hmm. And so this is really the second half, and we intend to win this fight. All right. We'll see. Just no overtime. We don't need any more extra. No overtime. No, we, no we, overtime. we need this decided one way or the other here coming up. Mike Collier, good to see you. I know you're going to be all over the you. state and probably back here again, so we'll talk soon. But safe travels to you. Thank you very much.